Welcome to the Immutable Mindset. Get ready to buckle up, folks, because we've got a wild transformation ahead on the Immutable Mindset. Today, we're taking you on a journey with a TradFi and now crypto wizard, a man who's gone from laughing at people buying NFTs to proudly owning and displaying his own crypto punk as his profile picture. Sergio is a true alchemist of the modern era, who's not only embraced the world of Web3, NFT, and blockchains, but has become one of its leading voices. Starting his career at the esteemed Goldman Sachs, Sergio learned the ways of traditional finance, but little did he know that fate had other plans for him. Enter a chance, in, a chance encounter with a departing colleague named Fred, who was on his way out of Goldman at the time to work on what he would call a crypto startup. This led Sergio down a path of discovery. Oh yeah, and that little itty bitty, itsy wincy, very little startup turned out to be none other than Coinbase. So talk about friends, right? From Goldman to Barclays, Equity derivatives trading desk. Sergio's love for crypto never waned, it only grew, leading him to take the final journey, the final leap, and go on against the final boss in the traditional finance game. Leaving Barclays, he joined the gold standard for institutional self custody Fireblocks as their resident NFT degen and sales lead. I'm sorry, kids, but you're likely not getting that title. But now, and more importantly, he's Fireblocks senior director of business development. From Discord to Discord and event to event, Sergio's roots in the crypto, NFT, and Web3 space have become ever entrenched, leading him to being featured on Coindesk and Bloomberg, and most recently, he spoke at the most influential tech event in the world, CES. He's curated Real Vision's Metaverse gallery full of NFTs, worked with and personally met Punk6529, and more importantly for this show in particular, he is a part of history, as we just told him. As we at the Immutable Mindset, powered by Probably Nothing Talent, are proud to say that both Adam and I are individual owners of his new NFT project, Seize the Meebs. And we agree, we won't let the institutions steal our JPEGs. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dogs and cats and plants, join us as we welcome Sergio Silva to the Immutable Mindset. Welcome. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Adam. That's, uh, you know, if my mom spoke English, she would love that introduction. Well, we will we will translate it for you and send it over. That's not not a problem. Serge, good to see you, man. Hey, thanks, thanks for having me. What a what a couple of weeks on this side. Uh, it's it's actually nice to be able to log off Twitter for a second and talk to friends. Well, we're happy to Indeed. have you on, and uh, I believe you are our not our first episode, but you are the first guest on the Immutable Mindset. So welcome and thank you for. Um, I guess uh, dare I say it, popping our cherry over here. So let's get to it, Kevin. I'm Absolutely. honored. I'm very honored. Just be gentle. And uh, and for mom, I am half Dominican, so would be happy to translate this after the fact. By the way, there we go. But let's uh, let's let's go ahead and dive in. Let's uh, let's go let's go back to your mindset. You know, when you first started hearing about NFTs, because I was right there with you, right? I, I thought everybody spending money on these things are either fucking crazy, or they knew something I didn't know. But honestly, I thought it was the former, right? And and you were at that same place when you saw G Money. And for those who don't know, he's just a, a, you know, for these purposes, he's a renowned NFT collector. You saw G Money buy his crypto punk for 100K. What were your thoughts on NFTs at that time? And, and why do you think you had such a visceral reaction to the amount of money spent? Well, you know, I was sitting on a traditional trading desk where we value companies uh, based on quarterly earnings and reports and projections. And, you know, a lot of those companies don't have a ton of tangibles, but it is a business and, and you know, you buy equity in that business. And so you kind of have something to go and derive valuation from. And then I see this article about this guy who bought a JPEG for $140,000. And I'm like, you know, $140,000 is a lot of money. It doesn't matter how much money you have. That's a lot of money. I mean, that will buy you uh, well, back before the bubble will buy you like a nice house in San Antonio when I went to college. So to me, that was like, ridiculous. Like, you know, you said words that I, you know, can couldn't repeat at work, but it was like fucking idiot. Um, and, and it really caught my attention because, you know, I worked on Wall Street and you see a lot of excesses. Uh, you see people with houses that they'll never fill up and just like the most flashy ways of displaying their wealth. I never imagined that JPEG could be that. Yeah, that's that's that definitely comes to flashy when when you uh, have a hundred and forty thousand dollar piece of digital collectible that you put as your your PFP and then and then that, that's what you got. That's that's it. 
and there's no utility beyond that. It's just the profile picture, definitely. You know, that, that, that leads me to another part of the intro, which was your, that, that opening title at Fireblocks. Resident NFT DGen. I wanna say you have a kindred spirit here because every time me and Adam go into a new client meeting, I am, my first title is resident DJ before much. recruitment, talent strategist or anything, right? So uh, I'm curious, you know, walking, walking into these meetings with what are very professional web two and finance people, what, what was it like shaking their hands as the, as the resident NFT DJ at Fireblocks? Well, and, then, I and then one more question. Did you create that title or, or did I? That? No, so, you know, I, I just to tie it all together, I saw G Money by his punk. I went down the rabbit hole. I thought, you know, he was an idiot. And I think now he's one of the most genius people in the space after I got to know him. And I had no understanding what NFTs were, right? People always think it's just a JPEG, but of course, you know, they're more than that. They're actually the token and, and what that represents and what that opens up. And so after learning about punks over a weekend uh, where I spent 48 hours on Discord, I decided to just go all in and I couldn't stop thinking about him. It was like high school love when you can't <laughs> stop thinking about him. Smitten. Like the other person, very much. And to the point where, you know, I was at Barclays and, and my boss was like, yo, stop talking about crypto. Nobody cares about crypto. And I was like, actually, the clients are very engaged. They think it's super interesting. And he's like, no, we're not going to talk about crypto here. Um, so I was like, all right, fuck it, I'm out. So I decided to go to Fireblocks and, you know, I didn't know anything about crypto. I was very interested in it, but I didn't really have a lot of experience. Um, but the fact that crypto is so open source, right? Like it's, it's at the heart of it. Um, I was able to pick up a lot just from being on reading on blogs and reading online and Discord. And so it really gave me a huge advantage because when I started Fireblocks, I was like, hey, wait a minute, you know, I'm kind of early for once <laughs> and uh, people don't really understand NFTs and I think they're going to change the world. So I kind of just gave myself the title because one thing I learned in Wall Street was that you kind of have to find a way to capture attention, right? Like we are in the attention economy, like this world we live in today is attention economy. So, you know, everybody's like all super like posh with their titles. I was like, I'm the resident NFT DJ. And that always caught the attention of people. Um, so that's that's how it came about. I never had that title officially, but people at the office would tell you I'm the resident NFT DJ. That, that's, I mean, that's pretty awesome. But, you know, we, we're in the recruiting business here and we talk about transferable yeah. skills. So let's, let's kind of flip the script on that one and talk about the transferable skills you brought from 12 years in institutional finance from Goldman and Barclays over to the Web3 DJ world. I mean, what... Let me kind of spin it in a different way. How does that? How does those skills and what skills give you that distinct advantage, especially for Fireblocks, combined with your Web3 DGen uh, skill set? Sure. So for Fireblocks, I think what was interesting for them was the fact that I understood financial markets well, the setup, how to you know, when you are in a position like the one I was at Barclays, leading the Latam Equity the, the Rift Sales Team, you know, we had to pitch new products and get permission internally to sell different kinds of payouts and structured notes and the like. So having knowledge of the inner working of bank processes was really valuable. And then as we were selling to financial institutions and hedge funds coming into crypto, you know, a lot of those guys are crypto native just because they've been here for right. two months more than you have. But in reality, most of those DeFi funds and the like have a very heavy traditional finance background as well. So being able to speak the language and bridge that gap was, um, I think was one of the biggest factors that helped me really you know, hit the ground running at Fireblocks. Um, it was it was that just being able to say, okay, this is very similar. Um, you know, at the end of the day, like a market is a market, regardless. Um, and I was cross asset at Goldman first, and so you understand that FX, yeah, it's different than equities, but so bid and offer and marginal buyer and sellers really make the market. And so that combining all that helped a lot. I mean, you're almost a true, dare I say, Web 2.5. I mean, you talk about the the crossover between. The, I know you're full Web 3 at this point, uh, Kevin. Kevin, back to you. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, you, you nailed it, right? That an expert in this space is basically somebody who's like a day a ahead of you. Than, yeah. That's how, right? That, that's how fast this industry moves. And, and, and you know, I, I wonder for, you know, for people like, for instance, like me, I, you know, I've never sat at a trading desk, never been an analyst. And there's, you know, the majority of people are going to be more like me in this space. You were recently on a podcast with, let's go back to G Money. Um, you guys were, you guys were kind of talking about 2022 and what you were thinking about for 2023. And, and you discuss something near and dear to my heart, the democratization of finance. And I'll speak for me very quickly. I, I can't tell you what, what DeFi summer 2020 and governance yield farming meant for me. 
in terms of my understanding of TradFi, of bonds, of equities, of what is convexity, right? All that information. I think that's so important for the normal user that, that um, you know, I, I, given that we're going to a phase where you're seeing, you know, Reddit water down what an NFT is to a digital collectible in order to get people on. You're seeing gamers water down kind of what the, the verbiage is. How do you see the democratization of finance and that education evolving in the future, given that we're kind of at the adoption phase where we want everybody in versus everybody getting that hard education? I actually hate the fact that people are washing NFTs down to one dimension of digital collectibles. Don't get me wrong. Some NFTs are digital collectibles and nothing more than that. But the reality is that just really limits people's ability to understand what NFTs unlock. And so I hate it. I absolutely hate the fact that we're like, oh, don't call them NFTs. That's a dirty word. It reminds me of when Tinder came out and people were like, oh, you're on that app. Oh, my God, you're on that app. Like, you must be such a nutty boy. <laughs> and you're like, no, it's just a very efficient way of meeting people that are attractive to me and that have similar interests and not having to go and spend, you know, $20 a drink at a bar every right. other weekend. And so it was technology kind of like making something that we do in society much more efficient. Uh, Tinder and now NFTs. And so when people are like, oh, well, digital collectibles, listen, I want to onboard everybody that we can. I think it's super helpful. But I think onboarding them with just a limited understanding of their potential, it's just a disservice to them. Because, you know, for me, even though I was in finance, like DeFi didn't really appeal much other than transferring money back home to Mexico. Yeah. Uh, but I wasn't really interested in yield farming and the like. I didn't have the time to put into it. But um, NFTs, I was like, wait a minute, this is really a way to build a community, a platform to deliver value and ideas. And so, you know, if somebody had just told me, oh, crypto is just, you know, yield farming and that's it. It's like, you know, high yield interest accounts. Maybe but, I would have never looked further. But I got to ask you too. I got to try to jump in here. I mean, from your past experience when you get, but like, there had to be the speculative element of NFT collecting. You had to think about the the buy, flip, and sell, right or wrong? Sure. No, and that's the fun part, right? It's a twenty four hour, seven days a week market yeah. that is always there, and you always find people. And you know, let's remember that the NFT wave started at the end of the pandemic, as we're all stuck indoors, and you know, you lost a lot of connections. Of Living here in New York. All my friends moved to Nashville, Dallas, Miami. Like I was left here by myself with my wife, who I love, but right. you know. Easy with that one. In 24 hours. She might actually live. <laughs> she might. And uh, no, and so <laughs> I, I think, yes. And, and we can talk about the speculative part. I think it's just appeals to human nature. I mean, we are entrepreneurs are hard and risk takers, yeah. and that's why we've built this world that we've built. But to say, oh, you know, NFTs are just digital collectibles that might go up or down in value. It's it's just not even like five percent of of what their full potential is, and and I think it also limits those who might be in other regions that will have those ideas. I think of like a, going back to DeFi, right? Ave Stani from Finland, he is right. Like before, yeah. what I saw in traditional finance is only those you know PhDs that worked as strategists at the yeah. big banks had the ability to really create new products yeah. in finance, whereas in DeFi. Anybody can just go and create their own. Complete. Correct. Yeah, I, I was talking about this earlier, right? Technology is very age agnostic. Like, it's just kind of a prove it, right? So you learn it and then you prove it. And like, to your point, it, it really feels like we're going down the Voldemort route. Like, that shall that, you know, that will not be named, but it is. And it's important because digital collectible doesn't lead to a lot of curiosity and interest like that's but an nft a non-fungible token i had no idea what that was so that led me from rabbit hole to rabbit hole to the next rabbit hole because there's there's something interesting about some of these words that we use because they're brand new you've never heard them so they 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 peak a curiosity and and, and make you want to learn more about that and I, and I think to build on that kevin i think that the majority of us in the space we're naturally inquisitive and that's what draws us here yeah. we want to learn we want to learn something new and the pandemic you know for for better or for worse I mean, we think of all of those silver linings. I mean, for this for this sector, for this industry, for whatever you want to call it, 100%. So maybe because we're all kind of opening up a little bit, maybe that's kind of causing the dip, the bear, whatever the hell you want to call it, or just over, uh, I don't know. I'm sure we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, we're just speed running through human nature again. We're, we're, we're cyclical at heart, right? I mean, if you look at our day, we go around a star and, you know, 365 days, and then we spin on our axle every 24 hours. Like, we are programmed to be cyclical. Mm. And so, yeah, I would love it to be up only, but right. um, no, we're just humans That's doing human things. 
<laughs> no, definitely not. You know, in, in terms of the education piece and, and keeping that pureness of this space here, you know, a, as we do continue to water down and, you know, big brands are going to do this, right? It's growth, growth, growth above all else and adoption above all else. Do, do you know, does everyone need to take a, a course on how to interact with digital wallets? You know, how not to, how not to click on links and discords, what a burner wallet is like, how are people going to understand these things? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if they don't get involved and actually get to utilize this, how, how is that education going to happen? I got scammed on eBay for a PlayStation 2 for Christmas that I had saved the whole year. I, had, I was selling sodas after like soccer games. Um, I, I was young and in Mexico and I literally saved all my money for a year. And it was a PlayStation 2 was sold out and I got scammed on eBay. I, I was PayPal before they had the fraud guarantee. And so <laughs> that hurt. But it taught me so much. And I don't think I would have learned to protect my shit had I not been scammed back then. And poor little Sergio cried many times. <laughs> but it, it, you know, sometimes you just kind of like have to learn the rough way. And I really hope people don't get hurt. Um, you know, the rough way. Those, it's not the only way, but we can't, you know, just baby everybody either. Like if, if we do a good job at onboarding our family and friends, teaching them the right way and kind of like helping each other out, nobody needs to get fished. Nobody needs to get hacked or anything like that. But to also just give up that responsibility to some big brand to do it for us, it just goes against the ethos of crypto. I mean, it's also spawning innovation in the, in the security and, and, and the, across all of Web3. It's opening up new new companies and new technology and new products, which are fascinating to protect us. I mean, think about the early days of, of credit cards, how proliferous the scams were, and they kind of reeled it in. Very similar. Yeah, it's all technology. We're, again, we're just going again through the same cycle of, wow, look, this is amazing. It's worth $100 million. And oh, maybe it wasn't worth that much. But, <laughs> <Logan Paul. Yeah. laughs> but what's, what's left Bieber. behind? <laughs> they could afford, they could afford it. Man. What gets left behind usually what sustains what is actually, you know, sustainable. Yeah, is, is what really changes the world. And, and so we'll yeah. continue to see that, I think. Yeah, to, to that end, um, I'll, I'll tell my very quick, dirty story. I vault familiar with the vault exchange. That yep. that was my lesson. I, I had money on a centralized exchange. Uh, it was this was right around the time that everybody's like, get your money off, get your money off, get your money off. And I was like, ah, but but they feel like a good institution. They feel like they have my back. $2,800 later, mm -hmm. no, but, but it was through that failure, through that loss of value, loss of my time that I learned to not be on centralized exchanges. I got a ledger. I understood how to self custody and, and that whole process happened for me. So there, there really is something to just getting your hands dirty right now in a nascent technology as they're flying, as they're building a plane, as they're flying so that you can get your learnings into not. Nah. Yeah, and I think, you know, that <laughs> that experience is also going to help you guide others, right? And make sure that, yep. again, not everybody has to lose $2,800 in an exchange for everybody to learn. But you experience that, so many others experience that, and now hopefully they'll help others. Just like, you know, you see somebody get hurt doing something stupid in a car, you tell people, hey, don't go and be stupid. And so it's just a matter of how humanity and civilization works, I think. No, totally. And and kind of switching gears a little bit, um, but but kind of on the same theme um, in terms of like decentralized finance and centralized finance, you know, with with what happened at, at Three Arrows Capital and, and Celsius and BlockFi and Voyager and FTX. And then we can just continue going on. You know, all these all these centralized exchanges did exactly what we thought they would do. And, you know, we're we're as a result. I'm not sure if we're actually seeing an influx of financial institutions that are more curious about DeFi, but I'm curious if you're seeing that on your side. Hmm. So I'll tell you what, right? Financial institutions need to play by the rules and those rules yep. are not clear today. And so if you're a you know, stakeholder, a shareholder, a director of such a company, you can't just say, oh, well, screw it. I'm going to YOLO it, right? Like it's, it's so unfortunately, until we get regulatory clarity around some things, they, they even if they want to, they can't. Um, at Firebrook, we definitely see, you know, we're talking to the biggest banks in the world. We have the largest custodian bank in the world on the Fireblocks platform. Um, and there's a lot of interest. It's shifted over the last two years. Um, I can tell you at first, they were very interested in doing Bitcoin trading, offering that on their retail wallets. From there, it moved more to like uh, high yield savings, DeFi style stuff. And now it's just a tokenization use case that I think is really going to be the one that brings 
of those large financial institutions into you know blockchain uh, more fully because it really it really helps them solve a problem. It's not them chasing a trend. It's really a solution to a problem that they have. And so, yeah, tokenization, I think, is going to be the big unlock for financial institutions once we have regulatory clarity. Can I, can I pull in a thread there? Because I to that end, I just saw Larry Fink of BlackRock talk about that, right? I think he said the, the, the use case for the future is just that tokenization. What, what, what problem does tokenization solve for these institutions? So many problems. If you think about, for example, bank loans, which is a market that trades, you know, OTC, bank loans take 45 days to settle when you trade them in the market. And so just think about the capital that is locked there for 45 days um, and, and how valuable that is, especially for banks that have, you know, regulatory requirements to hold certain capital ratios. And that is just money that's just dormant there. So if you make those processes of settlement and just, you know, being able to use your knowledge proofs to confirm trades without really needing an, an army of 300 people in the back office, it's just efficiency, which at the end of the day is what technology does, right? It's like, it helps us be more efficient. So that's why it's really the solution that, you know, banks have been waiting for, for a lot of these problems. Imagine like sometimes I, I, over, over the weekend, I was watching trading places and it kind of made me have this thought when they're, they're literally trading commodities with pieces of fucking paper. And that wasn't too long ago. Orange juice, yeah. FCOJ, right. like think about it. Like, <laughs> looking good, Lewis. Like, like you can't, you can't. Even, like, <laughs> like, how far have we come in the last fifty years from a technology standpoint? And we're only, you know, ex exponentially, insanely increasing the speed of of of, of technology. It's what well, we're going to see happen, and the evolution is just mind-boggling. What are our kids going to see? Right, 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 right. I mean, if you think about just the iPhone, right? It's been what? I mean, I was still in college when it came out. Um, gosh, what, like 15, 15 years, years, something like yeah. that. Yes, it's, yeah, I it's sold the first one as an at t rep. Nice. Wow. Nice. Um, yeah, I got nothing for that. <laughs> but Kudos. it's, uh, no, if, you, if you look at the iPhone, it just went from like a bigger screen to then having a camera to now we don't use it as a phone. I mean, I don't remember the last time. Oh, my wife's on a business trip right now, so she's been calling. Uh, checking on our dogs. But um, who uses the phone as a phone now? It's, it's, your, it's your credit card. It's your camera. It's your way to communicate with your friends, your family. It's your everything else but a phone. But it's still a phone. So, yeah, I think, I think that's kind of like what's going to happen with this, too. Whoa. We did not sign that guest up for uh, a, spot, a spot. Yeah, apologies. I'm, I'm, I'm home alone and the dogs are, are um, it's, they're not getting as walk as they usually are. And they're a little impatient given that it's very cold out. So they want to go play, but they get too cold and they, they pull back in and they realize they didn't play enough. Yeah, they're city dogs, man. I, I think that's fair. And I, I saw recently you were watching three of your nephews. So I'm sure you had a little bit of training. Uh, Brothers-in-law, actually. Yeah. So my, my uh, wife is a big family and uh, yeah, they're like teenagers. It was so funny. It's just such a different generation. Well, it's like, oh my God. So let's talk about that for a second. Like when you're, when, what's the age gap there? So uh, there's eight kids. The oldest is 29 or 30. The youngest is 11. Okay. So you're watching them in their day to day and they're engaging. Talk to us a little about the conversations you're having with them around Web3 and NFTs and crypto. Are they are they are they involved? Are they are they deep into it? Are they asking you questions? Are they looking up to you? Sure. So, you know, it's it's four girls, four boys. The, the oldest boy who's nice. now in college, um, he actually will almost finish paying for his uh, education at UVA from building metaverse um, architecture stuff. So crypto voxels on cyber stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, Look at that. Clap it, it was up really that. nice to, to help them. Creating opportunities. Yeah, it was really nice to help them, you know, come into the space and, and some good friends of mine who are very involved in that. Um, in Neon DAO, we're like a metaverse focused DAO. Like they helped him and yeah, it, it, was, it was really good for him. The other ones, um, one is really into making videos. So I gave him my Mebits um, 3D models and he's playing with them. I apologize, the dogs are still playing. Um, and then the other two are just not really, they don't really get it. They don't really get it yet. They're like too young, they don't understand. Um, one is really into memes. So I was showing him how like memes have economic value in this economy. And he was like, well, I make a lot of memes. Can I make a lot of money? Mm. I was like, Let me well, show you something over here. <laughs> um, but, you know, they, the funny thing is none of them question digital asset ownership. Mm. Like to them, it is, it is something that 
very natural. It's like, oh yeah, my Roblox box or whatever they're called, or my Minecraft and like stuff that they own in video games. They're like, oh, I get it. It's, it's you know, you tell a 40 year old, oh, I own this digital thing. And they say, what, why, like how? Mm, you so tell funny. a 10, 12 year old, they're like, okay, cool. Yeah, absolutely. The, yeah, I think it's so cool that we talk about it. Gener this is, you know, generation alpha. This is the this is the generation that's going to absolutely have grown up with this and everything is just going to make absolute sense to them. They, they will have grown up with multiple exponential technologies in their faces. Uh, so so, yeah, all this just makes sense. But good. Great segue in terms of memes and memes. And let's let's go ahead and talk about your new let's NFT drop. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about seize let's talk memes? about seize the memes. Seize. Yes. Which is an O to me bits for people that don't know. And it has a particularly interesting concept. Yes. Please, so the, right. So going back to the punks who are like yes. almost the, the genesis of NFTs, even though there was a few before them. Um, the punks were created by by these two programmers called Matt and John. They go under the company named Larva Labs. Um, and they created the punks in 2017. Punks really didn't pop off until two, tw like 2021, right? And so four years passed by. Uh, they created another project called Autoglyphs, which are these beautiful generative artworks that are fully on chain. Yes. And now, you know, we have so many platforms and so many good artists that are doing generative art on chain. So Larva Labs has really been, you know, like years ahead of their time. Um, in 2021, in May of 2021, actually April, they launched the Meebits. And it is the first 3D uh, metaverse ready kind of PFP, but they're not really PFPs because they're full body. And so they came out with the great fanfare. You know, the punks had just pretty much like 10x in the last month and a half. And um, then they just kind of died. Um, the board apes minted the week after or before. And with Yuga Labs coming into the scene, it, they took that uh, utility approach that we now see in every project. You buy an NFT and you expect different things mm -hmm. out of it. Whereas punks, they were free, right? They were given away for free. And Matt and John, they didn't really do much to do anything about them because to them it was a finished product. It wasn't and even same a thing with right? It wasn't even like a correct. It wasn't Discord. It was just it for punks. Yeah, there was an early Discord. Probably. Um, yeah, yeah, it's still there. You can go back and like see some of the messages, and they're like excited about like a zombie trading for one ether, which was like three hundred dollars at the time. I think the last zombie was like one point two million dollars a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so Mebits, they took the same approach where like they gave you three D ready models that you can use in different you know, software and the like. And so their, their thinking was the community is gonna go and build something with them and run with them. But no, Yuga came into the scene and everybody just wanted to expect airdrops and you know, mutants and all this stuff. And maybe it's just kind of like went completely unattended for almost a year until Yuga Labs decided to buy the Punk's IP and the Mebits uh. from Larva Labs. And so now, you know, it's been almost a year of that announcement. It's March of last year. The expectation is that Yuga will develop the Mebits ecosystem, integrate them into the other side and something like that. In between that, there was like eight people in the Mebits community that stuck around because we like him. I was one of them. Uh, I mean, there's a little bit more, but like, you know, it's, it's a very... For a, such a large, prominent project, it's, it, it's like a sleepy Discord sometimes. Mm. So it's kind of nice, right? Like every other Discord is like just you don't scrolling have to be like it. so much you're information. Not gonna, you're not going to be off it for half a day and come back and just lose like miles of scrolling on that. It's still, and, and we'll like, you know, it's, it's just a handful of people. So we'll know each other and we interact. It just feels like Punk's Discord back in the day before they popped up to me. Yeah. And I just liked the project. So I was like, okay, well, you know, the intention of this project was for the community to do something about it. You guys definitely working on it. They have a team of like four or five people. Uh, but meanwhile, like, why don't we just go and show how awesome the Mebits are? And given that the current meta in NFTs is memes, I was like, well, it's just perfect. Let's meme the Mebits into relevancy. Um, and I was a little hesitant, but I had the opportunity to have dinner with Snowfro. Actually, at CES, you mentioned that I spoke at CES. And, you know, he was, we we're sharing stories and he's also, you know, Mexican background. And I was like, man, I'm so dying to do something in NFTs for myself, right? Like I've been a collector and investor and everything else. But it's like, I wanted to really get that full understanding of how everything works from every side. And he said, listen, you have a good head on your shoulders. Uh, you, people know you, they respect you. When you have a good idea, just run with it. And so I had the idea, I ran it through Discord and then I texted him. I was like, Eric, 
I got this idea. Now, people don't know, but Snowfro owns a full set of Mebits. Every single type of Mebit. He has a really beautiful Mebit collection. And he goes, dude, go for it. Hmm. So I was like, okay. And so we launched the Mebits. The, the Seize the Meebs, I'm sorry. Wait, is this your first NFT drop? This is my... I, I dropped an NFT a while back that Tony Herrera bought and, had don okay. um, and donated the pros proceeds. Then I did another charity project dish where i had a um call it it's a wall that i have in mexico and there's four spots for nft pfps to be painted on oh, cool and we yeah so oh, we ra we we did auctions for those and so um batsubium um who else um aku so M micah johnson mm. yep and another person with a pickle uh doodle one we donated about well we we got like sixteen thousand dollars out of that and then we used it to buy uh, beds and fridges and all this kind of stuff for orphanages back at home in Mexico. So those were like not really projects. Thank you. Thanks to thanks to everybody that supported actually. That's great. But they're not drops, right? They were just more like using NFTs for for good. This Amazing. is like my first project yeah. that I've like actually had to manage. But just pause that for one second and let's just talk like because the light bulb went off. I mean, when when the war broke out in the Ukraine, I mean, we saw it there. We saw the incredible amount of fundraising that went into that. That's the good PR that needs to get out there, right? Like yeah. that's a good shit. That's a good word. But instead of all the, the, the shilling and the and the thievery, right? We need to talk more about the good stuff and get that word out there. So, so keep up the good stuff there, Serge. Thank you. I think also goes with the whole like, you know, digital collectible thing. Like, Collectibles, those, they don't really make you think of like, oh, this is a good way to fundraise, crowdfund for a good purpose and reward those mm -hmm. that support, right? Because you can have a project where you drop a token in exchange for a donation, but then in five years, you can go back to that, the token holder and like drop them something else or, or yep. engage them something else. So it's a great way, you know, I get calls from, yeah, from the blood center here every other day. Um, but imagine if I got a token for donating blood the first time and then in a year they drop me like a cool, piece of work from a cool artist. And they're like, hey, come on in to redeem it. Yeah, why not? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing there's a, there's a collection that I work with that we know called Young and Sick, and they're putting out, they just did a um, an open uh, an open project. And if you if a couple of tokens and you get the physical art, like that's a nice piece. You have that IRL, digital, whatever the hell you want to call it. But those are things that people like. The, some people, it, it'll also help some people transition into the space. Fidgetal, it just kills me. It's, it. it's like only the worst work in Web3 besides digital collectible. No, you don't like that one at all. No, no. It's like when they try to make here in Manhattan like new neighborhood names yeah. by like making like so middle Manhattan. It's like, oh, Mima? Yeah. Like, no, bro. Like, stop at Tribeca and Soho. That's Soho, it. South of Harlem? No, it's not going to work. <laughs> so, what, so what are we calling it then, right? Is it is it just part of a loyalty? Is it just part of like, you know, is it utility? I mean, is utility a bad word? It's an NFT. I like utility. Okay, we'll go with utility. I will I will stricken the word fidgetal from my record. Yeah, uh, I, it, there's a little reaction I get. We we have a client of ours that they kind of coined the word, so I I definitely use it a lot. But um, you know, I, in terms of in terms of the you know when we first or what at least when I first took a look at the the collection, it immediately spoke to me because I, I am definitely a resident DJ and and and, and uh, I am a DJ and love it. But for so long in this space. It's been about the community. And when I did my research into your background, like that's the central theme of, of your coming into the space is community. You know, that, that four hours in the, in the crypto punks before you bought it, you found community. And ever since then, you've been building it up. You know, when, when, when we were looking at this, we bought the, me and Adam both bought the Manib Festo because it spoke to us, right? And for those listening at home, uh, just quickly, I'm going to quickly rattle off some of the tenets of the document because I think it's important for you to hear what what go ahead adam was there something you want to say before Nothing. i did that no go for it okay but yeah there's something i wanted to, to hear about his collection of the manifesto because it really speaks to the core reason why why i'm here to be honest and I, i'm sure i'm not alone on that here they go we stand on the shoulders of giants we are here for the culture we believe in the memes we are heeding the call to seize the memes of production we believe in provenance we appreciate the right kind of utility and we are looking forward to the open metaverse. Hmm. So my, my question, provenance, utility, mass appeal, and metaversability, which is my new favorite word. We'll use that. Why are those the four central tenets of this NFT project? So for me, those four tenets parallel what the Mebit's value proposition is, right? So the provenance of having been Larva Labs' third project, again, Larva is three or four years always ahead of their time. 
um, the utility that now Yugo Labs is going to, you know, probably integrate into them. Um, the mass appeal, I mean, these are really cute human-like characters. And while people are in love with animal PFPs today, I do think in the future, actually, if you look at the history of art going back to the caveman days, any museum, 95% of the art depicts human forms. We love ourselves. We just, you know, we, we were voyeuristic as they come. And so that's the mass appeal part. And and for NFTs, you know, what brought a lot of people into the space, other than the money, is just the art, the fact that you can buy digital art, right? So to me, art, mass appeal, that goes hand in hand. And metaverse ability, the fact that maybe it's come with ready, fully rigged 3D assets that can be used in the metaverse. And for me, the means you know, and just the culture will be the foundation of us building that open metaverse, that virality of repeating, hey, this is really cool. Like, this is what you can do. That That's how you build a culture. That's how you build a civilization, right? It's that common belief in something, you know, in Jesus, in a different kind of God, in fire, and like whatever it has been through history is that common belief in an idea that builds a civilization. And so that's why I think metaverse ability, you know, ties it all together. I love that. And, uh, and I'll, I'll be completely honest in saying I went straight DJ and I own three cards now, uh, most recently this morning's drop. And I am looking forward to, to, to the, to the upcoming ones. But, you know, for me personally, as a holder, it's been a fun experience. Was creating the collection a fun experience for you? You know what it, it was and has been net net very fun. But I've learned a lot about myself in the last two weeks. Just, you know, the collection skyrocketed. It went from 0.05 Ether to 4 Ether for the Genesis token in a week. That's an 80X. That's and the amount and it, of ETH that's been traded is crazy. 2,000 Ether has been traded. And so that brings, obviously, kind of players and participants that are not aligned mm. with the vision, which is just to make really awesome Mibit memes with really dope artists. And I'm really lucky that I've been here for two years. I have really cool artist friends. Um, and so that's that's always been the idea and obviously the pillars of the manifesto. But now there's the expectation of profit and when everything's going up, you're a genius mm -hmm. and people love you. And then things correct as they should and then literally have people in my DMs trying to come and kill me. And I'm like, all right, kid, come on, chill. Um, and so it, it has been an exercise and a lesson in just managing emotion, managing expectation, communication, uh, tokenomics, um, and 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 it's it's been it's been fun. I mean, it, it's been good. Um, we are very focused on delivering our vision. We have a team of four people. Hmm. We have a great you know partnership with Venture Punk, which is a, a venture studio uh, ran by Jordan Lyle, fellow punk. They've been helping us behind the scenes. We're working with Six Five to Nine's team. They're giving us a lot of pointers, documentation, and then a lot of different collectors that have reached out and say, hey, I love what you're building. Let me help you out. So it's just been like really, really fun. A lot of artist friends are like, love it. What do I need to do to get involved? I'm like, all right, just make, make a meme about Mibits. I mean, look, that's, that's the ethos right there. Everything you just spoke about, the collaboration over competition. Yep. Right? I mean, this is a pure example of it in, in practice here. But my, my question that I wanted to ask was, you're talking about the, the, the negative side of it, the downfall. Did anybody warn you about that? Did anybody coach you and say, hey, Serge, you're going you're gonna to get a fucking waterfall of shit coming your way once this thing starts to dip, and you better prepare <laughs> yourself for that. Get a big umbrella. So the, the funny thing is that I spent the last two years advising founder friends and artist friends. I've held prize every, one of, like, every other major drop on Nifty Gateway. Um, early before like the bubble, I was involved. Um, and so I've seen the toll it takes on my friends and, you know, group chats, uh, mostly founders and like me, I stuck around because, you know, friends with everybody and I've seen how, how, how toxic it can be. And so I, I, I was ready for it. There's certainly an element that, you know, I always just as an advisor hung up the phone and that was the end mm -hmm. of it. Whereas now, I mean, to be honest, the first two weeks, like the week before the project launch and then launch the first week, actually this last three weeks, call it, I've had an anxiety that I've never felt in my life. It's just been wild to like the anxiety of, I, I don't want people to get hurt. I don't want people to lose money. I know there's people are gonna FOMO in with probably money they can't afford to lose. And honestly, I just wanna make badass memes. Like that's, right. that's intention. Have, if people wanna buy them, buy them. But that's but yeah, that's, that's trying. It, but that's a, the heavy is yeah. a heavy as a hand, right? Heavy as a sword. Like you're 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 going to have to manage 
those emotions. You can't you can't have both worlds of it. And listen, everyone getting into this, we're all big boys and big girls. We know what we're getting into. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. And and for me it's been it's been a lesson that I wasn't expecting and I'm I'm just embracing full on, like, you know, hey, you've never been tested like this in your life. Um, there's people that are tested like this and it's like matter of life or death or just matter of whether they're eating their next meal or mm-hmm. not. It's been, you know, it's been a good business for me. So I have the luxury that, okay, well, you know, we've done something successful, but still like the emotional toll has been a little higher than I expected. No, thanks for sharing And a that. part of it has to, and a part of that has to be like JFC people, like DJs, calm the fuck down. Like seriously, calm way down if you go way back to like the mechaverse discord the mechaverse discord had like three hundred thousand people in it and they had ten thousand to drop so like there's already there's already a mismatch right somebody is going to get burned somebody right like they're they're, not everybody's going to be happy and it's just you know you you spend enough time in a discord it's like a 50 50 dichotomy 50 percent are for the pureness of it the community they're long-term holders they want to see it thrive they're going to help you and do everything they can right and then the other 50 are like when's the fucking number going up man why aren't you doing more why why is my nakami moto like so so let's do this in real time because i actually saw today that in response to the community and and said complaints you guys kind of changed the drop mechanics a little bit and and your your you're enhancing the role of the, is it the Naka, Nakami, Naka, say it for me. Nakamito. Not gonna work yeah, so here. Nakamito, Nakamito was that original card that I dropped. There's 550 of them. My idea was, you know, this is a token that will hopefully be held by long, you know, visionaries that share, you know, to me, it was just gonna be me bit holders. I thought that were gonna be interested in it. And again, there's not a lot. So I was like, okay. And so now that we have, a, a large holding of these tokens realized that a lot of flippers had them on and they were very, you know, just minting and dumping, minting and dumping because it was pretty much free money to them. So we're switching that. We've taken a lot of feedback from the the collectors, a lot, a lot of feedback, I communicating a lot. You know, we're, we're trying to get to the right spot. Um, it is, it's funny because just, you know, our last drop on Tuesday, there was not enough cards to go around and people were like, why are you not letting like one card and two card holders drop? I mean, mint this, I was you're there. an asshole. Thank you for being there. And then now today that it was a little slower. People are like, oh, you're an idiot. Cut the supply. Nobody wants this. And it's like two days ago, you guys were clamoring for these tokens. And now, you know, you're like, no, you're an idiot. Don't sell too many of them. So it is. It's been an exercise in patience and in learning. Yep. You know, we, we go back to what got us here, which we want to really deliver something of value. Dope art. I mean, the piece we dropped today literally changes with the time of the day on your browser. So to me, it's wild that there's a token out there that, you know, we're seeing it's what, 4 p.m. here in the East, uh, in the East Coast. But then somebody in like Asia will be seeing the night version of it. And then somebody in Europe will be seeing like the evening version of it. Like that is that is amazing. And again, more than a digital collectible. It's like, what else can we do with this kind of stuff? So yeah, painful to hear some of the feedback from the flippers, but really, really like assured from a lot of like the actual collectors and friends who are like, we love what you're doing. Keep going. Oh, yeah. Just keep Hell going. Yes. Totally, totally on the on the friend side. Keep going. Um, you know started as a DJ in here, but I'm here for the long haul. And I think you guys have some, some damn good plans and a damn good foundation. So definitely keep going. You know, I, I, I think you have one of the most instructive stories when it comes to this space. Uh, I heard, I, I believe you did a, you did an interview with Raul Paul and he agreed, uh, you know, he thought you had like, seriously, one of the most instructive stories when it comes, you know, what being somebody that, you know, you started when you started in NFTs, your first thought is these people are fucking crazy. And now you're minting your own projects. What advice would you give to someone who's interested in creating their own NFT collection or investing in NFTs for the first time, given your, um, you know, just your story uphill both ways in the snow? Yeah, I think it's something that people say and, and a lot in the space and you don't take it into consideration until you've gotten burned a few times, but really is do your research. Right, there is no need to go and invest any kind of money. It doesn't matter if it's two dollars or two thousand dollars or two million dollars. If you don't understand what you're getting yourself into, there's many more people out there that do, and you're probably the one that's gonna pay for for that. Hold the and bag. so I think 
Right. I think doing your own research is, 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 you know, it helps you, it protects you, but at the same time, it educates you. And it really gives you the opportunity to say, okay, well, like, actually, this is something awesome. It's not just like number go up. Like, this is interesting and valuable because of X, Y, Z. Or, hey, this is deeply flawed, but if we made this change, it could really work. And then you go and launch your own. And so for me, I think that's what's helped me a lot is that, you know, doing a lot of research and trying to understand what works for people and what doesn't work. We've done it with our project. Yeah, we've changed the minimum mechanic pretty much every single drop because we want to improve. We want to take feedback. Uh, things change, there's a lot of variables, and we want to just do things better. And in order to do that, you need to learn and educate yourself. So that is always, for me, the first word of advice. And to, to pull on one thread there, because you know th there's gonna be people in the audience that are brand new to this. And I say this and other people say this, and I don't think we ever like take the time to actually say what this means. And I would love it if you would just for one second would. What does do your own research mean? And do you have any examples of how to start that for somebody that's never started it? Sure. So people always ask me, I want to do crypto, which token should I buy? <laughs> and it's like, always. dude, imagine, imagine just standing outside like a mall and being like, I want to have kids one day. Let me just grab another person and say, hey, we're married now. Let's pop out a kid. Like, no, why would you do that? Even if they're beautiful, you're like, why would you do that? And so, right, you test drive cars, you go on dates. Like you, we, yep. you do a lot of I'm testing trying, and learning and education. And, and, and so same thing with crypto. You want to be in crypto. You don't need a dollar to be in crypto, right? You need to understand what's happening. So what does do your own research mean? Read the Bitcoin white paper. That is the foundation of the space. It's really easy to understand. Yes, there's some stuff that might be complicated, but that really gives you the ethos of what we're here. Read the Ethereum um, white paper. The Ethereum white paper builds on top of the Bitcoin white paper. It's actually not a difficult read. And you actually understand how wallets work and how smart contracts work. And so honestly, like Mandatory. that's the first thing I send people. Right. And then depending on your area of interest, if it's DeFi, go on like Bankless or something like that. If it's NFTs, the NFT now and stuff like that. There's so many resources. Yep. There's so many people giving out free education and free content. Don't take them at their word, though. I think that's also important because you never know their intentions unless you know them personally. So take a bunch of different opinions. And as, as you iterate and learn more, you align with certain views, certain communities. And that's when you can say, hey, I want to be part of this. Heck yeah. Don't trust, but do verify. Yes, 100%. Correct. So we are almost at the end of our show. But before we wrap up, I did want to take uh, I want to take you through a quick lightning round of questions for the audience to get a better understanding of where your heart lies. So I'm going to ask you 10 questions. And for each one, I need you to answer one or the other. And for any that you don't, you have to promise right after this show, you take a shot of something strong. Yeah. If that's your vice. Yeah. If that's um, your vice. I'm, if that's your vice. I, yeah, I'm, I'm rolling Jan, dry Jan into dry Feb. But um, good for you. Yeah. Okay. We'll. Uh, Flavored water is a good second choice. Perfect. All right. Okay. All right. One, Charlie Munger or Warren Buffett? Ooh, I'm a big Charlie Munger fan. Nice. I, I, I've seen him speak in person at the Berkshire Hathaway conventions, and he's just so witty. I, I'm sure he loves memes. <laughs> Warren's smart, don't get me wrong. But Charlie's just, it's, it's amazing. Um, quick anecdote of Charlie, if I can. Uh, I was in college, drove up to Omaha with a couple of friends to listen to them speak. And they do this like 12 hour session of Q&A from the audience. And one woman goes up to the microphone in front of like, you know, this arena, it's like maybe like 25,000 people. And she says, Charlie, I read your book twice and I really didn't understand what you meant. What advice do you have for me? And Charlie is like eating seas candies and he goes, uh, I will give it to somebody who's smarter than you. Wow. <laughs> I thought, That's it. I thought you read it again. Body in here. Body in here. I was like, oh, this guy. Huh. Yes. Um, so, Charlie. Oh, that's awesome. And and one day I want to get you back on the show so we can talk about that story because uh, the, the uh, you know, going into the libraries on your year off and uh, getting up and asking yourself and actually meeting them was a pretty cool story. But uh, we'll, we'll do that another time. Sounds good. Second, the intelligent investor or Satoshi's white paper. Oh, the intelligent investor. Nice. I like I like Satoshi's white paper. Like I said, it is a corner store, a corner. Yeah, it's the foundation of crypto. But the intelligent investor for me was kind of what 
put me in the direction of, of TradFi and what honestly got me to where I live in Manhattan and, and you know, I, I met my wife in Wall Street and it just really changed my life. Um, I was studying engineering for a year and then I said I want finance and so here I am, right? I worked at Goldman and all that stuff. It's nice and it really started with just picking up the intelligent investor and reading it back in the day. Don't Sounds agree. like he doesn't agree. Crypto or TradFi? Ooh. Uh, obviously crypto, but that's actually a tougher one. If we had diff- like more specific categories, there's some that I would pick uh, TradFi for sure. Um, but as a whole, crypto. I'm making it hard on you on purpose. Being conservative or taking risks? Oh, taking risks mm. all along. There you go. My all man. along. Barclays or Goldman? Oh, Goldman. Absolutely no question about. It. Listen, I spent seven years at Barclays, five at Goldman, but it's it's funny. The first day at, at orientation uh, at Goldman Sachs, um, they came in and they told us, "Listen, uh, you will always be the Goldman person. Wherever you go, whatever you are, at whatever point in your career, you'll always be known as a Goldman person." And seven years I was at Barclays, to my clients and everybody else, they were like, "Oh, he's the Goldman guy." It was just <laughs> so wild. That's crazy. I've never heard that. Good to know. Is it called football? Or soccer? Oh, football. My man. <laughs> do you seize the moment or do you seize the memes? Mm. I think you seize the memes. There you go. Olivia Rodrigo or Taylor Swift? Oh, uh, depends. <laughs> For what? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big, I'm a, I'm a big Swifty. I'm a big Swifty. Um, I love, I love her music. I think you can, it's, she's somebody that puts, like her her emotions and her experiences into her work like song, and, right? and i yeah and, and so i i can appreciate that because i do the same and i wear my emotions on my sleeve and so yeah taylor for the music for the music there perfect yes. there we go bitcoin or ethereum oh ethereum ethereum oh, i man. think bitcoin is great but ethereum has just changed my life and and so many others and will continue to change the world and last question nft degen or nft creator Ooh. Degen at heart. I think it's also kind of became a nice. dirty word, but it doesn't have to be. I think oh. Degen speaks to passion, speaks to having skin in the game, speaks to being able to take wins and losses. Um, when you're a creator, you're mostly just, you know, a little bit more conservative. Uh, Degen is kind of like a batch of honor at this point. It is. You know, we, we will keep that alive. And I know Adam will do his part. All right. I'm getting involved. As, I'm, getting, I'm going. Deep. No, I mean, I, my I, hands are dirty. As as, this this past year, man, I've gotten I've rolled up the sleeves. I'm in the mud. <laughs> I was re- I was referring to us going into client meetings and me being the resident NFT. DJ. Oh, I, I, I answer where you going that one, but it's okay. You, you, you got that one. You got that one. Uh, all right. So uh, we, we are here to wrap up our show. And to wrap up our show, we, we do it in a way that I start my mornings. And every morning, I pull up Chat GPT and I ask it a joke. Sometimes it makes me laugh. Sometimes it makes me giggle. We'll see what's going to happen here. So I'm going to tell you the prompt I gave it, and then I'll give you the joke. Let's see if it's funny. Hey there, Sergio. Oh, you know what? I don't have the prompt, so I'm just going to give you the joke. (laughs) We'll go back. Hey there, Sergio. Welcome to the show. So I hear you traded in your suit and tie for an NFT portfolio in a crypto wallet. I can only imagine the looks on your old coworkers' faces when they found out. I bet they were all thinking, ha, 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 he's a DJ now. Hey, by the way, where do I buy Bitcoin? Ha! Welcome to the wild world of Web3, my friend. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's, that's about right. Yeah. I'll that, take that, it that's back. a good response. That, I'll, I'll take it full circle. My boss at Barclays who told me to shut the fuck up, and that's a quote, <laughs> about crypto and NFTs. I woke up one morning about six months ago, and I have four texts from old clients. They're all screenshots of his morning email talking about board apes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Way, way to bring it home. Sergio, greatly, greatly appreciate you joining us for the show today. Why don't you tell the people uh, where they can find you online? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Sorry about the doggy noises. Um, I'm at Sergito Sergito, both on Twitter and Telegram. Um, Sergio Silva on LinkedIn. I don't really use LinkedIn that much. Um, but yeah, Twitter, you can find me there all day long and our projects at at Seize the Meeps, M-E-E-B-S. Check it out, people. We'll link it up in the comments in the show notes. Sergio, thank you for Please joining us do. Today, man. Thank you. I really appreciate you guys' uh, time and space. I, I love chatting with you, Adam and Kevin. Nice to, nice to meet you. 
Heck yeah. Thank you for listening to The Immutable Mindset. We appreciate you for joining us. Please follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Immutable Show. Subscribe, comment, and network. Catch us next week for more. Take care, everybody.